Hi, I'm Michelle Olivier, and you're listening to Hey, I Want Your Job, the podcast that looks at amazing jobs and what it takes to get them. Hi, and welcome to Hey, I Want Your Job. Today is fascinating because I am talking to Mark and I kind of have his job, (laughs) not at the same level, but it's a very similar kind of role. So I'm super excited because it's a great learning opportunity for me. Um, But also we get to bring a a fresh perspective and anybody who thought I might be a totally crazy person, hopefully Mark is going to reinforce that some of the things I say make sense. So that somewhat dubious introduction having been said, Mark, what is your job title? Yeah. So um, first of all, thank you so much for having me. And it's, it, it's great to be here. Um, my job title is executive coach and founder because I have founded my own coaching company. Okay. And so what does that mean you do? Um, what do I do? So when, when you cut through, you know, all the stuff you see on everyone's website, what I really do is that I work with mostly senior leaders in all variety of companies to help them build skills for one or two use cases. One is because the company is preparing them um, to take on a new, more demanding role. And maybe the company perceives that, okay, this person doesn't have skills X and Y and they really need them. Um, And what I also do is I work with folks who are in a role and um, perhaps there are certain aspects of that role that they're not really stepping into. Um, So that's also when I work with them. So those are really the two classic use cases. So that's really interesting. So do you ultimately then is the company your client or is the individual your client? Uh, It's a great question. I I think of the individual client as my client, but it is in the service of the company. So when I'm I'm here one-on-one on on Zoom or wherever I am with Mm -hmm. my client, I'm not thinking that I'm coaching the company. Um, I've got my client in front of me and I'm coaching him or her. But at the executive level, the line between company and individual gets a little blurrier because yeah, they are they the all ones. represent the company yeah, yeah. And, and, and the company is footing the bill. So, mm-hmm. okay. So the, you're, so in your case, the company fits the bill. So I work with individuals right. who are, they're footing their own bill when they work with me. So that's a really interesting differential dynamic. So a big part of what I do mm-hmm. is I am the place where when executives have a crisis of faith and they're Mm. like, I don't, I just kind of wound up in this job and I don't know how to get a different one right? (laughs) or I don't know how to do some part of this job. Like they come to me as a safe space. So a big part of what I think of myself is I'm almost like an agony aunt for executives that they're like, help me. Like I need to complain about not knowing how to do this. And I don't feel safe saying, I don't know how to do this in my company. Is that the same with you? And, and, and kind of how does that dynamic work? Yeah, I think it's, it's related. We're probably cousins in that, in, 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 in that regard. So when, when a client will come to me, he or she will say, I really aspire to be an SVP, but the feedback that I've received told me has told me in general that I'm not ready. And these are the two things that I need to get better at. And they're usually skills. And so they can, sometimes they come to me and they're upset. Sometimes they come to me and they're optimistic. Sometimes it's all of those and everything in the middle in one, one hour coaching session. Sure. But yeah, but they are usually very, very motivated to, to accomplish their objective. So there's no problem with motivation whatsoever. They want to be there. Well, and I find, so dealing with executives, I love doing it. It's one of my favorite parts of my job is when I get to do my exec coaching. But one of the things that I really enjoy about it is the challenge of breaking through executive veneer Mm. into human being underneath that because they are on so much of the time, because they are the like steady hand decision maker, et cetera. I, I can't coach veneer. Mm. I have to coach what's behind it and, sure. and talk to that person. And so I find that there's always like in my first session with them, there's a good like 20 minutes, sometimes more of just me kind of like needling mm-hmm. to get through. 
how do you, it must be the same thing with you. Like you have to get to a place of vulnerability for them to be able to learn no matter yes. how motivated they are. Yes. How do you help your clients get to that place? Yeah. And, and that's, and it sounds like our, our challenge is the same, right? It's, and I don't necessarily think of it in terms of, of, of a veneer. Um, most of the leaders that I work with know how to be themselves in their roles. They're comfortable with themselves or else they not, they would not have gotten to where they already are. Sure. They may have to show something a little bit different to their stakeholder groups. They may have to evolve in, in, in a specific way. But to get back to your, your direct question, I think one of the things that separates coaching from any other way of learning in, in the workplace is that coaching is a relationship. First and foremost, it's a relationship. And any good relationship in any walk of life is built on trust. Yeah. And trust doesn't develop in an hour, sometimes it takes three hours. Sometimes it'll take half of an, a coaching engagement, two or three months before I and me and the client feel that, you know what, we're really hitting our stride because yeah. sometimes clients are very well defended. Sometimes they're open books, but my job is to create a space in the relationship where they feel they can tell me anything, what they're stressed about, what they're confident about, the fact that they don't think they can get to the next level. Maybe they're suffering from imposter syndrome you know, whatever it is, they have to be able to tell me. And mm -hmm. I try to create that space as quickly as I can. So what do you do to do that? How do you achieve that space? You know, you know, Michelle, it, it, it's, it, I don't think it's a whole lot more complex than being human mm -hmm. and asking questions, being general, gen, genuinely curious about who they are, actually listening to their responses and demonstrating mm -hmm. that you care about them, not just as a client, but also as a person, as we would for anybody. Yeah. My heart gets in it, right? Sometimes clients say, do you really care about us? I mean, you know, we, and I was like, oh my goodness, of course we do. Yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And I think like, also, I think that, you know, for me, especially with my executive clients, because you do have that, that really deep bond by the time, you know, you've gotten yeah. there that, you know, when, when it ends, you're kind of like, oh, <laughs> I wonder how Steve is. You know what I mean? Like you, you have wistful moments where you think yeah. of them, not that you, you know, need to be on their Christmas card list, but a Christmas card wouldn't hurt Mark. I would right. take a Christmas card. And I, and I do get Christmas cards and it's, and it's lovely. And it's awesome. I'll send some of your way. I'll, I'll forward some to you, but yeah, you, 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 you do get involved and um, you want to see them succeed because you know how hard they're working mm -hmm. and you know how much they want it. And you know how much they're trying. And sometimes when I'm pushing them a little bit into the deeper end of the pool and they're letting me do that, right? Um, mm -hmm. Which is, I, I mean, that's that to me, that wins my respect when somebody is allowing me to, to guide them. And of course, I, 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 would, I really want them to succeed and we stay in touch. And um, yeah, it's, it's, it's real nice. Well, and I think that ultimately, you know, as a career coach, the more my clients succeed, the more in, a, in some ways I succeed, right? Like sure. if my clients never succeed after I coach them, then I'm kind of a shit career coach, <laughs> <laughs> which, you know, it's not all on me, but if, you know, you got a certain level that there's, there's some, some odds that go with that. Right. Yes. So that, that brings me to something I, I personally am really frustrated about. Um, and I'm wondering what your thoughts are. I noticed that when 2020 came, it feels like everybody who worked in recruitment for a hot minute and lost their job, put a sign up in their front yard that said career coach and sure. or resume writer. Sure. And I'm just like, I, so the market is completely flooded. Yeah. And I keep getting people who come to me either through some of the nonprofit and charity work that I do or other things that are like, I spent and some exorbitant amount of money on services and I have nothing to show for it. And I'm like, I find that very frustrating as a real professional. And I, I'm wondering, mm. am I being overly sensitive? Are you seeing the same trends? What is your yeah, thoughts? I think the barriers to entry are, are, are very low. If you want to be yeah. a coach, right? You've, you don't but a really sign in your says coach here. <laughs> and yeah, exactly. And and yes, 2020 has probably seen more of that because more people's lives have been disrupted. Mm -hmm. But what I've noticed in the executive coaching world that that's always been true. 
Mm -hmm. And there, there are always more coaches than, than there are clients. And what I've also noticed, especially out here in, in Silicon Valley, is that 20% of the coaches are getting 80% of the work. Sure. Um, so who do you think should be a coach? Because we're not in any way regulated. No, so what do you think, what is the magic sauce that, that makes somebody the coach that you should go to as opposed to all of the other people that are claiming to be a coach? Yeah, it's a, that, that, that is a great question. And I get that, I get asked that question all the time from prospective clients, right? Sure. Why haven't I asked you, Mark, that I should have asked you? Um, yeah, yeah. I, you know, so l- let me start by saying this. Coaching co- among coaches, we are a big tent. And I think we need to be because mm-hmm. there are a lot of challenges in the workplace that our prospective clients are experiencing. And it takes, you know, a dozen Swiss army knives, right? To have enough yeah. tools um, to be able to deal with the stuff that comes at us. Many tools, many perspectives, many theories, many models. So I, I'm a big tent guy. I'm not one yeah. of those who has a whistle and say, oh, you're not a coach because you didn't get this certification or because you approach coaching this way. That's not where I come from. And there are some who do come from that place, but I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm not one of them. For me, it's about the skills that you bring to the party. Um, mm-hmm. Are you a good listener? That is, for me, is number one, okay? Um, it's much more, it, it's much better for a coach to be interested than to be interesting. Mm-hmm. And I've trained a lot of coaches and a lot of coaches try to be interesting, right? They try to think of the perfect thing to say or, or the perfect article or the perfect podcast. No, to me, that's not what it's about. Be interested. Listen really well. Really hear what your client is saying. Understand what their fears are, th- those kinds of things. So that's kind of one. Look for a coach who is a great, great, great listener. Um, number two is a coach that knows how to push you when you need to be pushed and to back off when you need to be backed off. Mm-hmm. And over the, co- over, over the course of a six to eight month coaching engagement, there are gonna be times where me as a coach, I feel I need to push a little bit. Mm-hmm. But there are also Definitely. times when, you know, they've had enough for right now. And if I push them any further, you know, they're gonna run <laughs> and not towards me, right? They're gonna run away. Yeah. So it's my job to have, whether you call it an intuitive feel for how much the client can take or to have the conversation, you know, where do you feel you are? Do you feel you're right at the edge or do you feel you can, and a coach that can really flow like that and have a good sense of where your client is at any given time. Um, And, and three, someone who, with whom you could easily establish personal, personal rapport. Um, I call it interpersonal Velcro and there there needs to be some there. When I'm being interviewed by clients, I'm always like, if you don't think I'm funny, you probably shouldn't hire me yeah, right. because I really think I'm jokes, funny and like, <laughs> this is not going to work <laughs> if only one of us thinks I'm funny. I'll tell you straight. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I think that, that that's such, such an important, uh, that personal Velcro is such a piece. Do you think there are, I would agree with you that there is no coaching certificate or piece of paper that makes you a great coach. I happen to have one. I happen to be living in the UK and they have a piece of paper for every damn thing over there. And so I had to get one for what I was doing, but it wasn't like, I was like, oh, now I know all the things, all the knowledge of the world has been put in my head. And so I don't, I don't think that that's necessarily what makes great coach or bad coach. What do you think in terms of like experiential things and in terms of skills that they've gathered over the course of a lifetime, et cetera, as a knowledge base is a good place to start for helping somebody exec. Because I wouldn't trust somebody who had not engaged with executive level function in some way within an organization to do executive coaching. It's a very different world. You need to know something about it from a firsthand perspective, I've not sat in the C-suite, but I have recruited for the C-suite. I have yes. designed the recruitment processes for the C-suite. Like I know how to get into that world. And so that, you know, what other kinds of things do you think from, from that knowledge base is, is really yeah. important? So the, the bar for me is, can I understand the pressures that my client is under? Now I don't have to have lived them certainly. Mm-hmm. Um, and a lot of coaches come into coaching for their, their executives 
who feel that they've done it. Maybe they've made their money and maybe they're semi-retired. And they say, hey, I've learned a lot, of, a, lot, a lot about business in my 20 years. I'm going to coach. Great. And they come in with great intentions. But what they miss, what, what those folks typically lack are the listening skills, are the process skills, are the conversational skills. They don't really have those. Some do, but many, but, but many don't. They're here to impart knowledge, not to build a reciprocal a relationship. relationship. Yeah. Exactly. It, 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 it's not a 50-50 relationship. Mm -hmm. They're there. They care and they, and they come at it for the right reason. But when they're Absolutely. in the conversation, they're usually giving advice. And that's yeah. only part of the coaching um, equation. So I think a small part. A small part. So I think <laughs> having been around companies, now I have a consulting background. So I had the advantage of consulting to literally hundreds of companies before I hung out a shingle and became a coach. Mm -hmm. So I've never been in the C-suite either in, in, yeah. in, in a large mm -hmm. company, but I've worked with a lot of C-suite executives and I know what it looks like and I know what it smells like and I know what it sounds like and I know what, what leadership looks like when it's being done properly at that level. Yeah. I think also there's something about, not to toot our own horns here, people who come from consulting backgrounds, but I do think there's something about coming from that world where you get paid to be a truth bringer, mm. to be the person who comes in and analyzes diverse situations quickly and then speaks power and uh, speaks truth to power, right? So yeah. your job is to come and say, this was a terrible fucking idea. You shouldn't do that anymore. <laughs> and, and that's true for all consultants. And I think that that kind of innately sets you up to have a better knowledge base for this kind of work than somebody who has like a, a, a long history at a single company or a couple agree. of companies. I, I hear you and, and I agree with you. And, I, and, I, and, and there's another side to that in my opinion. So I think having a consulting background gives you that. You have experience being a truth teller and you're not afraid, right? So you can say things that others want to say, but perhaps won't. I think a consulting background, what it also gives you, you've had lots of practice making first impressions. Mm -hmm. So when you're a consultant going into a new situation, you've, you've probably got five minutes yeah. um, and they're kicking your tires and they're saying, is this someone I trust? You know, are they credible? Do they know yeah. their stuff? So we're used to having to show up in a way that's going to build others' confidence in us quickly. Now, that does, that's not to say that internal people don't do that. They have to. Um, but they do it in different ways. Mm -hmm. now, I have to say, yeah, like I've tried to be an internal person and I, after a career in consulting and I was like, oh shit, you want me to go to a potluck? Oh, yeah. it's a different game. I'm not a it, potlucker. <laughs> it's a different game. And some people, and you know, it comes down to knowing yourself, right? Yeah. You go to that potluck, can you handle it or, or, or can't you, right? And then it comes down to self-knowledge, but where consultants can fall short is helping clients with nitty gritty implementation kinds of things because in our consulting lives, we're usually out of there, right? Yeah. We're not sticking around. So that's implementations problem. Bah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And so for me, that's that's what I've had to learn over the years is when I'm working with a client on nitty gritty level stuff, you know, a long change management program. Um you know, really hanging in there and moving the ball up the field yard by yard by yard by yard yeah, um, was something that I had to grow more comfortable with as a coach. I would say for me, I struggle with um, along those lines when the question is, you know, I've worked at the same company for 10 years. I've worked with broadly the same team. Me and person X have hated each other for five years how do I move that needle so that we can have a more productive relationship? And my answer is, I don't know, get a different job. <laughs> because, <laughs> you know, in my heart, that's my answer. Obviously, that's not my out loud answer. But right. like, those are the areas that for me, I know as a coach, I struggle with. And I think that's part of why I try to stay more in my lane and more in terms of like the career Mm -hmm. movement and trajectory. So if somebody came to me with those, skills, I would probably refer them to somebody more like you yeah. to be like, Hey, mm, I mean, I can tell you what I think and I can help you, but I'm probably not the best person for me. Like people ask me what, how do I know a decent coach? And for me, one of the big red flags is if the person tries to assure you that they're a great coach, <laughs> red flag, red flag, like, 
if they're not giving you a list of four other coaches that you should also consider right. and five reasons that they may not be the right one for you, right. then that's probably a good indication that they are yeah. not a good coach. Yeah. Um, I, I couldn't imagine approaching an initial meeting from that point of view um, at, at all. And I, I have to believe, and I do believe that every prospective client I meet, some who select me and some who don't, they know what's right for them. And I'm, I'm at peace, whether they choose me or whether they don't choose me. I think you can't have ego in it. Do you know what I mean? No. Like I, I very clear that there's nothing worse than a badly matched coaching session. Oh man. Yeah, when somebody painful. hires you as a coach and like, you guys just got it wrong mm -hmm. and you're like, I, I have, I have had them where I've been like, I'm just going to. I feel like this is not a good match. I'm going right. to give you a refund and I'm going to give you a list of some colleagues. Yeah. <laughs> might be a better match for you because it is like, it is two ways. And yes, you know, we have to make money and all of that. But I think that for me, I don't want to do any of that without being honest and making sure that everybody involved gets the best thing. And yes. so much part of that is having that synergy and having that, you know, relationship that, that is working. Well, it everybody. sets the tone, right? So that first meeting you have, I treat it, even though it's just to get to know you, I treat it like a coaching session where I'm trying to do the same things. I'm trying to build trust. I'm trying to establish rapport. I'm trying to listen as best I can. To me, yeah. that's I, I'd rather have them experience me as a coach in that very first meeting rather than a salesperson. So I'm going to pause now and ask the question we ask everybody, because we just talked about the fact that we acknowledge that we do have to get paid as coaches, that we're not, you know, Mother mm -hmm. Teresa here. How do you respond when, um, when somebody asks you how much you make? <laughs> um, I respond by saying none of your business. Um, okay. <laughs> yeah, I, I certainly don't advertise how much money I make. I mean, you know, in, in, in general, coaching can be a high paying field if you're good. And if, if you've got the relationships and, yeah. and that's what it comes down to, like, like it is in most professions, you know, if, if, if you're great at it and you've got the relationships and you treat it like a business, it, it, it it's your calling, it's coming from your heart, but it's got to come from your head too, Absolutely. because it is your livelihood. Um, you, you, you can make a very, very good living. Now I live in Silicon Valley. Don't forget. So you, know, <laughs> you can also pay a lot. Everything is relative. <laughs> Uh, Absolutely. My parents lived um, in uh, San Jose in the Bay Area for years and years and years. Yeah. And my, my dad was always like, you should come out here. You know, you can come in. My mom, they owned a, a company that did consulting, the same oh. kind of consulting I was in. So yeah. they're like, come be an HR. And I was like, oh, no. Oh, no. That is not a level of price tag for cost <laughs> of living I am interested in. But thank you so much. Yes, yeah. it is beautiful, but also no, thanks. <laughs> yeah. it, is, it is an expensive part of the country. And, you know, people are leaving now, you know, since, since COVID. They are, and they're all coming to me in Austin. So that was going to be one of my questions for you is, you know, we hear in some press that Silicon Valley is dead and that the <laughs> yeah. blah, blah, blah place is the yeah. new Silicon Valley. And there's always a new one of those, right? Like, for a hot minute, it was Austin, and then it was like the research triangle. And like, there's been like five new Silicon Valleys. Yeah. As far as I can tell, Silicon Valley seems to still be pretty much Silicon Valley. But we're, we're still I'm here. not boots on the ground. Yeah. So you tell me, like, is that overblown? Is that overhyped? Do you see validity in that? What's it's a, it's a great question. So, you know, I, I've lived in Silicon Valley or I've lived in the Bay Area for 30 years. So I've seen I've seen a lot of obits. Um, over 30 years, I've read a lot of obits, um, and we are still here. So, you know, a little bit of a historical perspective. Right. We Not are a yet. bit lost, right? That's just the nature <laughs> of California in general, right? It started out in the gold rush in the 1840s, right? Absolutely. So, so I think I think there is that, but and and there's a big but for me. I I think this round of obits you know, that we're reading now probably mm -hmm. has a little more truth to them um, than okay. previously. And I, I think, you know, you said, is Silicon Valley dead? I, I think the even broader question there is defining work as a place. Is that dead? 
That is absolutely what I personally think. And I was going to ask you that. Yeah. So I have seen multiple news stories from big tech, the big four across the, like the hyper global mega corpse of the world right. saying we're not renewing leases. Right. We're not going back because our second largest line item is re is real estate. Mm -hmm. And we just saw figured out that we don't need it. Yep. Is that so that has even, I think, broader implications in the tech space, right? It does. Where so much of what they do can be done remotely and always could be. But so many of the companies have created themselves as a destination employer based on atmosphere, on, you know, we all know about the nap pods and the free bicycle rides yeah. and the space hoppers, right? Makes for great press copy. How are you seeing that the, they're merging that? How are they handling that transition? It's an awesome question and we're living it right now. So I've, I've got some clients, very senior level clients who I would call diehards and they're old school and we're an, you know, they'll say something like we're an innovative company and we need to be together to innovate. I've heard um, that one. We need a yeah. water cooler. <laughs> and it's, it's, it's hard to argue with those companies' success. They've been very innovative and they've been very successful. Mm -hmm. My question is, and I don't think we know the answer to this yet, is what are employees' expectations of culture going to be? Yeah. So how important is the red couch going to be, right? How important is the, uh, the air hockey table um, going to be when you're comparing that with the ability to work from anywhere? Yep. And I think we'll know whether Silicon Valley is starting to fade more than it's faded in the past in about a year, maybe even two years, once COVID hopefully is in the rearview mirror and companies from a policy perspective have made decisions about, okay, how often are folks gonna need to be here? How often are they not? We all know it's gonna be some kind of hybrid, but you know, what, what does that look and feel like? And I think and then, then we'll know. And I think there's also the like, and, and how do we keep being us? Like it's hard to be a team to have an identity on Zoom. And Lord knows managers have tried. You've heard all of the stories of crazy, like crazy yeah. hat Zoom meeting and mm -hmm. bring your pet to the Zoom meeting. And all none of it seems to have really worked. And mm -hmm. certainly none of it has been a cohesive brand feel right. like the nap pods and mm -hmm. the like all of that sort of thing. And um, so I think it's going to be really interesting to see what that looks like. I get asked those questions a lot in the talent space, mm -hmm. but obviously you're helping to coach the people who are making those decisions. Exactly. Are those questions that your clients are grappling with? Is that something you're helping them process or is that not even on the radar yet? They're trying to put oh, one foot in front of the other. Oh, no, no, no. That, that is the, a prime target. That is the radar. <laughs> I'm not necessarily helping them make those decisions. Um, but I think but, you're helping coaching through. But yeah. I am coaching many of the people or some okay. um, who sure. are involved in those discussions and, and, and trying to figure that out. And COVID accelerated trends that were already here. Absolutely. But yeah. COVID just fast forwarded it and it, and it brought it front and center. Um, and yes, my I husband works for a big four and we were saying it's a, which is why they're always on my radar because you know, he's a director of a big four. So we get all those emails. Sure. Um, and he, uh, he and I were saying the other day, we feel like COVID was just like a, a 10 year fast forward right. in terms of remote working, but it's about a bit, that's a big paradigm, like, leap for everybody that it's not, we didn't do a technology that hadn't already been there for ages, mm -hmm. but we just forced everybody into it at such a level that I, that I, nobody could have anticipated. No, I think not that quickly. Um, it, it, and, it, it, and, and now we're, now we're faced with the right decision, right? How, yeah. how do we, is work a place? Yeah. And, and if not, what is it? And I think it's also interesting that I know in the Austin area, mm -hmm. um, there's been a lot of pushback because some across sector, a lot of employers were like, oh, we can go back to work now, wear your mask, but come in. And in my space, what I've seen is I've got clients who have suddenly expected people to come in for an interview and top talent has just said, absolutely right. not. Right. 
that is not a risk I'm looking to take. Yep. You want me to come in for a job? We can negotiate on whether or not I'm going to sit in that office, but I am not walking in for that level of risk for a maybe. Yeah. Absolutely not. Not when there's yeah. Zoom. Right. That's reasonable. And like, I don't disagree. Yeah. But yeah, so, but so it's been, I think it's been very eye-opening because there were so many employers who felt like, the market is really shit and I can do what the hell I want because people are just going to be grateful to have an interview. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden they've discovered that there's this talent pool that went, no, no, exactly. Not only no, but kind of go fuck yourself. <laughs> yeah. Well now they're holding more cards. Um, yeah. And I think that's so interesting. Like it's just this power shift has happened that people, it's like the masses have turned around and been like, wait a minute. Why am I, I'm not literally going to kill myself for this job. Yeah. And I think offices, whatever they end up morphing into, they're going to have to be better than home. Yeah. Right. They're going to have to be better. And I think that's the question that a lot of workers, employees are going to ask. All right. So I've got that's to commute it. 45 minutes to get there. Is it better? And then 45 minutes back. Well, and, I and think in most cases, I don't think, I don't think the answer is going to be yes. I, I think home is, might be a little better. So I think that's strange. My husband worked for um, Microsoft in the UK because he's an import model. Um, so back in the early 2000s and um, when he started, we were young and dumb and he was super excited. He was like, they've got everything. They've got free McDonald's. They've got dry cleaning. They'll change the oil. Micro and it's like, it took about six months for us to be like, they only do that because their expectation is that you work 14 hours. Mm. So you can't possibly do those things on your own. But if they're all at the office, you have no need to leave, my friend. Yeah. And I think that some, I, my concern is that there are companies who have put toes in those waters for non-genuine, make this a better place kind of purposes like that. And I think that one of the things that I can see already that they're gonna be like, oh, look, we still have the free McDonald's or free sushi or whatever. And people are gonna be like, ah, I feel like we fell for that before. <laughs> yeah. I would rather stay home and sleep for an extra hour. If you're gonna make me commute, it better be really damn worth it <laughs> yeah. when be, I get there. It needs to be better. And yeah. I think some companies will be better and some won't. Mm. And I think that defining better is going to be such an interesting That's right. Because challenge it's so for not everybody. monolithic, right? Better is in the eyes of the beholder. Absolutely. So you are in this really fascinating position to kind of get to hear the minds and kind of the inner working of people in really interesting and strategic roles in Silicon Valley and all of that. Um, you didn't get that by putting a sign in your front yard that said, coach here, apply within. How no. did I didn't try that though? <laughs> <laughs> well, so that's a free marketing technique. You're welcome. No charge. Appreciate that. Um, but uh, so tell me how how did it how did you get there? How did you yeah. get a seat in those rooms? Yeah, it's it and it it I, I I wish I had an answer that 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 sounded very complex and involved and I had this strategy that I executed, but I'd be lying to you. It wasn't that. It 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 was building relationships. Okay. And, you know, I'm sure you hear this from a lot of people, but that's, that's what it is about. I've, I have client relationships that go back almost 20 years now. Mm -hmm. People who I've known for 20 years who continue to bring me in, they've jumped three or four companies in that 20 years and they continue to call me. And now not so much to work with them as individuals, but people in their orgs. Yeah. And from the very beginning of my consulting career, I invested in those relationships. And I only get into those relationships with the people with whom I want to be in relationships with. Sure. So when you, when you tell people to build relationships, some pushback here, but you know, what if I don't like the person? What if I don't want it? Then, then don't. don't pick that one. <laughs> then don't pick that one. You know, it's got to be someone who you like and respect. Um, and so that's, so what that's I heard, Mark, is that you mm -hmm. really recommend that people link in with people and send them messages that say, hi, how are you? <laughs> Hope you're having a great week. 
So glad you're in my network. Can we be friends? Right. That's the way to start those relationships. Is that, that's what I'm the hearing? Start relationships <laughs> as to do great work. And, and that cannot be underestimated, right? We, we talk so much about all these guerrilla networking tactics, but if you don't do excellent work, all of your networking efforts are, are not going to lead you anywhere. Absolutely. And that's especially true in a field like coaching where there's so many of us and I'm, I'm not a big fan of establishing a niche. I, 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 I don't necessarily believe in the value of it. I, I, I think Interesting. establishing a, a niche might cut you off from a lot of other potential clients. Mm -hmm. um, but boy, you need to do great work and you need to be excellent at what you do. And like in any other profession or in any other field, the cream really does rise in my experience. And I think there's also something to be said about passion though. Like my, like I've been in HR, so I've kind of done all the stuff. Like I've done L and D for a whole range of skills and I've done management coaching and all of that for soft skills and hard skills. And honestly, I can do those things. I have some interest in it, but my, my heart remains in talent acquisition and yeah. like deep in my soul, Mark, I really just like, if, if I just got to pick a legacy to leave on this earth, it would be that everybody quit using resumes and interviews as hiring tools because they are terrible mm. <laughs> and move to something better. Like, right. And so all of my everything brings me back to that. And so for me, I know that because that's my passion and that's the thing that I can get really excited about, I it's a, a niche, but it's a damn broad one. Yeah. Does that make sense? It does. So I, I think that, yeah, and, can I get and, you to define niche a bit more? Yeah, thank you. So when I say niche, um, I don't define myself as a communications coach. I don't define myself as a transitions coach. I define myself as a leadership coach. That's how I think about myself. Now, there are many coaches out there, and I know quite a few of them, who do have a very specific niche, and they fill that niche very, very well, and they do very, very well for themselves. That's just not how I've approached my business. I'm, yeah. I'm more interested in a broad array of leadership topics, influence, managing up, leading at scale, you know, um, board relationships, you know, mm -hmm. you, you name them that I never felt an, 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 a niche was necessary, but what you said about passion, I, I agree with completely. If you're not passionate about this work, go find something that you're passionate about. Absolutely. And I think, you know, with the niche stuff, like there's so many, it's, it's been interesting to me with clubhouse. I don't know. Are you on clubhouse yeah. at all? Familiar. Okay. So I stuck my toe into clubhouse and I went into a couple of like career coaching rooms. And I was like, these should be my people. Great. Oh, yeah, Mark. Not so much. Well, so part of it was a, a good reminder to me that not all coaches have to be the same. Mm -hmm. So they were led by people who were very fluffy and they were very, let me talk to you about being mindful and right. giving you a mantra and, you know, your daily affirmations. I give all of my client an affirmation. It's mm -hmm. like, I cannot imagine giving somebody an affirmation with a straight face that would make yeah. my ass twitch. Like, that's just <laughs> not me. Yeah. And so, but I know that there are, there were people in the room who said, oh my God, I find that really helpful. I find that really useful. And so it's a good reminder to me that like, I'm not everybody's cup of tea right. <laughs> um, and that there are different needs for yes, people, exactly. including things that I do just suck at. Yeah. Like big tent, right? Yeah. Absolutely. Get, back, get back to that. And I love that phrase. I'm big tent. I think that's my, I like that. Yeah. And we stealing that. that. Mine now. Go ahead. I stole it too. It's <laughs> not mine. Um, yeah. That to, to me, that's what it is. And if I have any mantra at all, it's meet the client where they are. Mm -hmm. So I want enough tools in my belt that if they need X, okay, I can do X. If they need A, B, and C, I can do that too. So I think a lot of coaches, which, you know, kind of, you know, gives me the shakes. A lot of coaches talk a lot about what they believe in. Mm -hmm. And that's important, right? I have beliefs too, but it really needs to be about what the client believes in. And it really need to, needs to be about what the client needs. And if you can yeah. meet that need, meet it. If you can't, maybe there's another coach who can come in and do it better. 
Yeah. So that's what I try to do. I always try to focus on the, where, where, where the client is and, and, and what they need rather than leading with my beliefs are X, Y, and Z. I like that. So I'm going to zig us once more into something that is of personal passion and interest to me for reasons that will soon be obvious. Um, we know that there's a lack of representation for um, BIPOC and females in tech. You swim amongst <laughs> those who could influence that. From yeah. an outside perspective, there is so much virtue signaling in this space. We want to change. We want all the ladies to come be in technology. We want all of the brown people in technology. And yet the needle remains unmoved. Yeah. Where do you think the disconnect is? It's a great question. It, 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 I don't know of a tougher nut to crack than the one that you just put your finger on. And I, I, and a lot of very wise and smart people have come up with lots of reasons why it persists. And I think there are lots of reasons. And I do think it defies an easy answer. I think if it was an easy answer, we would have found it and the needle would have moved quite a lot. Just given the nature of my profession and what I do every day, I tend to see it through the lens of culture. And changing company cultures, particularly in big companies, is really hard. And it, it, and it just takes a very long time to do. Now, that said, I, I can sit here and tell you that the companies where I coach and consult, most if not all of them are very serious about diversity and inclusion. And don't mistake, I think what they would say is don't mistake the fact that the needle is moving slowly with lack of intent and lack of mm -hmm. seriousness. Because what I've seen is that it is very serious. And I'll give you just a couple of examples. Um, one, I think what's happened in the last maybe two or three years, maybe a little bit longer, is that DNI has become a metric. Mm -hmm. And it's a metric that everyone sees, right? It's, it, it, it's a metric that if you're applying to, to a job for a job, you can do research. And if, particularly if you're considering big companies and you can see where they stack up versus other companies in their field. Yeah. And the old mantra is, you know, what gets measured gets done. So yeah. the fact that it is a metric, I, I think is helping. And it's a metric that's taken seriously and it has visibility to the board. It has visibility to shareholders, et cetera. So that's, that's one thing I'm starting to see. And then to offer you just a, a highly, highly, highly anecdotal perspective on this, okay? because I did check this out um, the other day. I looked through my client list. Right now, I've got 17 active clients, eight are women. Okay. Okay. And, and my mix has always been around that, usually around 50%, maybe a little bit lower. And these are all successful leaders. These are leaders not just in HR or, or you know, not, not just in legal, I'm talking about technical leaders as well, who the companies are saying, we think you're promotable. And one of the things we're gonna do to help you on that journey is to get you a coach. Now, a skeptical person, a mm -hmm. jaded person might say, mm -hmm. perhaps the reason you have that mix is because these companies believe that women are more broken and therefore women need more help. And therefore you see a higher percentage of people who get referred to you as needing assistance to be promotable rather than just being promoted. I don't see it that way female. at all. Okay. Um, because coaching, the way coaching is practiced now, mm -hmm. the broken clients or the, 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 the broken executives aren't the ones getting coaching. Okay. Okay. The ones who are getting coaching are, are the, the high flyers. Right. Good. And that's why they're going to invest in them. The folks who are teetering at the edge and are, and are perhaps right at the edge of derailing, those are the ones who are not getting the coaching investments. And that does my heart good to hear. But I, I, I wouldn't be really asking the question if I didn't ask, because that would be my immediate response to that statistical data, right? Would be, ah, but let's look at motivation behind it. Like, hmm. is this so that we can? Say we totally have women. We even gave them coaching and yet they were not able to achieve. Mm. Or is this, we are trying to move the needle, but you know, we don't have board seats available every single day. 
So, um, so that is, that is very, very interesting. So thank you for all of that. That was amazing. Sure. Um, I am also interested, you talk, we've kind of touched on it a little bit, um, but we, with regards to the accountability to the workforce, um, there are kind of two schools of thought in terms of, do you ignore the Reddit subthread <laughs> that is Google sucks? Or do you engage with the haters and say, hey, maybe we don't suck and maybe you're is, is an outlier experience. And I think that the current situation with like what happened at Goldman Sachs recently and some stuff like that has kind of brought that to the forefront. What is, I guess, what is your thought around that? And, and if somebody came to you with that, how would you coach somebody along those so lines? So if someone, um, maybe you can clarify what you're asking me. If mm -hmm. someone came to me with, with what? With how do I help to manage my companies when we, there's bad press about working for my company? Oh, okay. So bad glass door reviews, right? bad uh, Reddit threads, sub threads about, uh, you know, why it's terrible to work okay. there. We know that those are starting to really damage an yeah. ability to attract talent. Yeah. But like I said, there's been historically two schools of thought. One mm -hmm. is ignore it and hope it goes away. And the other is engage, 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 and hope to diffuse. Mm. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not really sure I have a strong point of view on, on that. I mean, I my angle on that question is more I tend to see the source of dissatisfaction among employees who are dissatisfied um, being relationship with direct supervisor, not believing in the mission of the company, feeling blocked uh, that the mm -hmm. role they want is, is, is occupied. Those are the, those are the reasons, or they don't agree with the company on it, or they stop agreeing with the companies on a, on a values level. Mm -hmm. um, those are the reasons when I run into folks who are, who are dissatisfied and are tempted uh, to leave those are usually the reasons that, that the grass will probably be greener because I might have a better boss mm -hmm. or um, I have an opportunity in a blue, a blue sky. Uh, I mm -hmm. get to be creative or innovative. So rarely does it cross my radar where someone will say, well, you know, the glass door reviews are kind of, kind of lousy. Um, now, do people look at them and read them and care about them on, on a senior HR level? Of course they do. So, one of the things I think that people on those places think is that all the clients that are on your list, right? So all of big tech, all of every major company is this faceless, soulless machine that mm. lives and exists to make money. Mm. But those machines are populated by human beings. So does it, in your experience, actually have an emotional impact? Does it register psychologically and emotionally with the people at the top when they go through periods of being reamed in the, in the press or having bad glass store reviews, or, you know, everybody decides this week that Google is the worst because they're all racist yeah. at Google. Like, does that have an emotional impact on the execs that you're working with? Do they, is that getting through? Um, Yes. I mean, I, I, I don't know any senior executives who don't have emotional connections to their work. I would hope uh, that would be the answer, Mark, but I feel like, you know. Oh my goodness. Yeah. You, 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 you couldn't do these jobs that are all encompassing and, and, and require everything you have and more mm -hmm. and being on 24 seven, unless you're emotionally invested and you care, there's no way you can do it. You cannot fake it. And I, I'm privileged to work with those people day in and day out. And I look at them and I couldn't do what they do. So when there's to. a bad outcome, <laughs> yeah. um, if I'm working with, 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 with a medical devices company and, and, and something happens because of one of their, de their devices, oh my goodness, that's soul crushing. That, 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 that is a seminal event because companies like that are in the business of saving people's lives. So I think so, it's interesting so that that's been my experience as well with my execs is that they take it really damn personally, way more how personally. How else can you take it? Yeah. And yet we persist in this societally held belief that they are faceless, soulless money crunchers. 
Yeah. We're, and I think I always think for my clients that that must also have a price tag emotionally that they, that their emotions and their, the effect that things have on them gets disregarded and they get called monsters and they get called heartless and all of those sorts of things yeah. by society. And I think that that must be one of the really difficult things about the role. Yeah, may maybe. And, you know, I, I haven't been there, so I, yeah. I don't, no, no one's ever called me faceless or soulless to my face. Uh, yeah. So I'm not exactly sure how that might feel, but, you know, the same person who is, who is leveling that kind of critique on business leaders can probably level the same kind of critique on me. And mm. if that's what you want to do, do it. Um, I certainly don't feel that way. None of the people I work with would I ever accuse of being anywhere close to that. Um, I think once, I think it's caricature is easy. Mm -hmm. um, real life is richer and more complex and get inside these companies and see how hard they work and see how seriously they take their missions and the sacrifices that these folks make. Now they're well compensated, right? Mm -hmm. But they, but the sacrifices that they make um, are are huge and they do it eyes wide open and, and it's because they believe in the mission. So over the years, I've become less cynical um, the more senior and senior I go in terms of the people that I work with. I'm not cynical at all. And I've <laughs> okay. seen them up close. So I would invite anyone who's gonna hate, get in there for a little while, move, move beyond the caricature, meet some of these folks and, and maybe, Maybe your opinion will will morph, will evolve. It's always much harder to hate on the individual level than it yeah, is exactly. at the big level. Exactly. It's really easy to to be mad at, you know, something that isn't a person. Companies so. are people. Absolutely. Well, um, we are out of time. It's been an amazing discussion. Before we go, is there anything else you want to make sure that we cover or propagate for yourself? <laughs> anything I'll just else? Say this. Um, Coaching is a wonderful profession. You get to interact with incredible people every day and the world needs more good coaches. So um, if it's something you think that you can do well, if it's something that captures your attention or your passion, don't let anything stop you because if, because coaching continues to rise in popularity, the field is growing and um, we're a big tent so if you think you are it, go for it. Nice. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your time. We'll have links to you and your work and everything in the show notes. Um, again, thank you so much. And thanks everybody for tuning in. Thank you. You've been listening to, Hey, I want your job. For more information on how you can get your own awesome job, visit ONH Consulting at www.onhconsulting.com. We offer incredible resumes, no-nonsense career advice, and real-world tips for landing a job in today's market. Check us out on LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, and Insta for more insider information. Soon, you'll be hearing us say, I'm Michelle Olivier, and hey, I want your job.